Welcome back. You're tuning in to Financial Fitness Northwest live on 1150 KKNW, where we help you navigate the mortgage and real estate market with expert advice from knowledgeable and trustworthy industry professionals. We are here with Tammy Lundeen, who is a broker at REMAX Integrity and has been in the industry for over 21 years. Tammy is a wife, mother of four, and grandmother of three with another one on the way. You're going to be one up on me, Tammy. (laughs) Uh, Tammy takes such amazing care of her clients that she enjoys a business built mainly on referrals from past clients, family, and friends, and she truly becomes their agent for life. Welcome, Tammy, to the show. Thank you so much for having me so much, Patricia and Sarah. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. We're glad to have you. So do you want to just kind of tell us a little bit about your business? Start off with, you know, sharing how you got into the business and what your focus is. Yes, for sure. I uh, wanted a career that would uh, be flexible for my family. And I always had a passion for real estate growing up with a father that was a builder in commercial and uh, residential. And I just always loved homes and wanted to have a flexible career. So I got my real estate license in 1995. And at that time, I, we had four children, and I took the youngest one with me previewing, and she, it was hilarious. <laughs> we had a great time. She would go with me and give her honest opinion about some of the homes, and we laugh about that to this day. She's 23 now. And uh, the opportunity to be in such a fun business, it's uh, just my passion, helping people, because it's so much more beyond just selling them homes or helping them get their homes sold. It's people, and people have lives, and there's different reasons why they're selling. It's not always happy, Mm -hmm. and I'm always there for them for whatever reason beyond the real estate need. Yeah, I mean, you and your business even, you know, and us too, I mean, it's the same. It's really just so much about you get build these relationships with people, right? Yes, and I've been so blessed with a referral base that I have and past clients and friends and family that remember me year after year, and sometimes I think, wow, I'm so blessed, and I really feel that way because I don't always have to be scrambling and cold calling and different um, uncomfortable things like that. I have a (laughs) great referral business that give me great leads. Yeah, well, I can attest to the fact that you take such amazing care of your clients, and and so there's no doubt that they come back to you. I I totally get that. Thank you so much. So um, I think... you know, um, in your intro, we, mes- um, we um, mentioned that you were went through this master negotiator class. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about how that differentiates you and how that can come into play when you're representing your clients with this um, knowledge. Yes, thank you. Well, even though I am a seasoned realtor of 21 years, I found that the markets have changed dramatically. Oh, and yeah. It's like <laughs> one year you can be, everything's wonderful. And so you have to be able as a realtor to be, open to uh, continuing your education. So when the MCNE uh, designation came out, I thought, that's for me. And I really took care and pride. It's a series of three courses that you take. And then um, it's great information on helping you with sellers and buyers as far as presenting and writing the best offer for each situation. Because you can have two houses on the same block, same floor plan, but much different situation depending on the seller and the buyer's needs. So it's just a really great course of study. And again, I wanted to continue my education and not just get stagnant in the business because it's an ever-changing market and business every day. Oh, Isn't that true? Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yes, that's an understatement. So do you are you split then? Do you work with buyers um, and sellers pretty much half and half? Or are you, you know, geared more towards buyers? Well, it's... Because I'm a referral agent, I do what my sell- my buyers or sellers need. So okay. many times I'll have a seller that's selling, but then they need to go buy a home too. Mm-hmm. So I help many times with both sides of that because they want to work with somebody that they can trust. So um, so I would say it, it ends up being about 50-50 and not by wanting it to be. It just, just ends up being that way. I love working with buyers and I so love working with sellers. And each one has different responsibilities and different challenges depending on the market. Right. Well, so, you know, do you often work with investors then or as well? or Yes. In fact, um, I do uh, love to work with investors. And I, one of my past clients, she's doing a 1031 tax exchange. And that's a great way for an investor to uh, basically swap investment properties and defer the tax hit that it would be. Right. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I, I just actually had someone call about um, a 1031 exchange as well. Um, and I don't think you know, people don't really know at all what that is. And since sure. you're going through it right now, do you want to share how that works for the, the client? 
Well, it's basically a like kind transfer, meaning it has to be held as an investment over here and then buy another investment over here. And so it can be a condo to a house, a house to a condo. Um, it can be any kind of real estate held in, as an investment. And basically, you put the money into a tax. Uh, we have a facilitator, a 1031 tax exchange facilitator. So at escrow, we'll transfer that money to the facilitator and hold it until you purchase another property. And it's very time sensitive. You have to identify the property you're going to replace in 45 days and then close in six months. Okay. So in this market, it's a little more challenging finding the replacement property. Um, yeah. It takes a little bit more time, but, but as long as you're on it, it's great. So it's a great way for an investor if they want to um, change it up. Like, for instance, one they're wanting to not have a one-bedroom unit anymore, so they're exchanging that for a two-bedroom unit. Again, it doesn't matter because it's held as investment. So it doesn't that doesn't have to be necessarily a like property. It just has to be an investment property, and Correct. it could switch to yes. any type of mm-hmm. dwelling. Then, yes, as long as it's held as an investment, it can't be a primary residence or second home. No, okay. unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd maybe. be great if right. we taxes. <laughs> I know <laughs> that would be no need for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, we'd, we'd be out of business. <laughs> Not good. That's funny. Um, so moving on, so um, do you, well, that's, that, doing those 1031, I mean, that is kind of a one-off thing. I mean, do, are very many people do that? or? Well, in my career, I've actually only done two, and so it's not something I do on a, every year. It depends on my investor's needs at the time. So, no, it is not commonplace. I mean, some people, I would think maybe um, in commercial or different avenues of real estate might do it way more often, but I mainly do residential condo sales. Yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a piece of my business, not the full package. <laughs> yeah. So what are you seeing out there in the market then as far as, you know, working with buyers? I mean, we all know it's kind of a tough market right now. Inventory is low, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we kind of all thought going into it, we're getting, I mean, it's supposed to be approaching summer. You wouldn't, well, maybe today you'd believe it. Yeah, but, today. <laughs> um, but, you know, the inventory usually starts to perk up and it seems like it, it hasn't. Um, are you experiencing a lot of, uh, escalation clauses, you know, uh, we do, especially on the east side. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, how, what have you been experiencing with your buyers? Well, funny you would ask because it's definitely filtrating south, and I even experienced mm-hmm. multiple offers in Graham. Wow. And, um, you, you know, you think, oh, there's going to be a lot of inventory in Pierce County. Well, those south end communities are also experiencing the same kind of a seller's market. Mm-hmm. And, yes, we are pulling out that good old escalator clause it's good and bad depending on what side you're on, honestly. And um, sometimes I use it often recently with the buyer because we don't want them to have to overpay. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a way, it kind of it's not as great sometimes because it kind of tips your hand as to what you would be willing to pay. Right, it's a beginning and an end with an increment. Mm-hmm. And so I found it's effective with buyers. But then I've had sellers that will just throw them all out and say, "Bring your highest and best." Oh, really? Because it does cap it out, and they Mm -hmm. don't want to cap. They want to get the top that you have on your escalator clause. So it's been interesting, and and with the lack of inventory and the buyers wanting to get a deal secured, you know, they're willing to do that. So, Yeah, so let's just, I think we should explain a little bit of what an escalation clause is for Mm -hmm. people who don't know, right? I mean, you're starting at, you're saying, I'm going to buy the house for Mm $300,000, right, up to three twenty five. Yes, in a certain increment. Right. So you're saying I will pay what a thousand dollars over the highest offer up to three twenty five. Is that how yes, it works? That's how it works. But I found that middle number that how many thousand you'll go above is the kicker right now. It's not where you're getting to, but it's how many thousand you'll go above. They want to see a bigger so number, like twenty five hundred yes. above, five thousand above. Yes. That's exactly it. It's and before it's like, Oh, we're just gonna do thousand dollar increments, but now it's like that increment is just as important as where you're going to because hmm. it gives the seller a few a thousand more fifteen hundred more right it is very interesting things have definitely changed and then are you guys experiencing down in Pierce County that are the values coming in with people escalating are they still coming in at value or well we haven't th- this particular property I'm talking about we did not do an appraisal because it was a cash transaction oh, well, that's nice but I think mm-hmm. that it would and definitely Pierce County is in a spot where King County is so high and it, it is remaining high for sellers Pierce County's I think has a little room for growth mm-hmm. and I mean I think King County does too but I'm just saying Pierce yeah. County hasn't quite gotten as crazy as up yeah. here so it's there's but it's still the frenzy is there there's mm-hmm. limited inventory 
causing the same kind of multiple offer situations. Right. Have you had any appraisal issues with these um, escalation clauses yet? Have you seen any issues with that? Um, I've had a few low appraisals, and I'm trying to think if it was from the escalation clause. Um, I'm sure it was. But yes, especially in the condominium market, because you're so tied to what's sold in that complex. Yeah. Where a mm -hmm. house, you have a little bit maybe Can more flexibility. So I have had further. a few low appraisals on condos, not major, but, you know, a couple thousand. It can be yeah. devastating to a seller if they're trying to move on. But yeah. So, yeah, it is a definite problem is the low appraisals. Well, and also, you know, with the buyers, too, and if they are first-time buyers and they're trying to get in, you know, mm -hmm. and then, I mean, do you see people, mostly are they coming in with the extra cash to cover the difference or does it blow up the deal? Yeah, You know, that maybe that's another place where mm -hmm. your negotiation skills can really come in because you, then you can negotiate with the seller to maybe come down or meet in the middle, right? And that's what we're still trying to accomplish. But then we mm -hmm. have new addenda that has come out, um, the additional down addendum that if you know you're in competition and you know you're going to be bid up to maybe a place where it's not going to appraise, well, there's an addendum we can add to the purchase and sale agreement that says, okay, well, the buyer has this thirty grand set over here that they can bring to the table in the event it's not appraised. And it's called additional down, and it's part of our financing addendum if you attach it. I have not seen it in South King County, but I've heard it's very heavily used east side and Seattle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have you with, seen it? Yeah, I've seen it. Well, what I see mostly is people are doing um, up here is, that they're saying, okay, we're you know we're gonna go to we'll waive the appraisal up to thirty thousand dollars in the case of a low appraisal, we'll pay up to thirty grand um, rather than waiving the whole appraisal. But a lot of people are waiving the whole appraisal. Mm -hmm. But then in what's happened is is that they don't have an extra thirty grand, so in that situation they have to change their financing. They actually have write write it out uh, a financing addendum saying in the case of a low appraisal, I'm now going to be putting 10 instead of 15% down mm -hmm. and I have $30,000 to put towards uh, the low appraisal. And um, that's when having like strong financing comes into mm -hmm. play because we're really involved with both agents during a transaction like that to reassure them that they do qualify both ways. I provide like two different pre-approval letters in a case like that. So Great. are you guys experiencing people waiving appraisals on the um, south side? I have not experienced it in my own business yet. No. No. Yeah. But it's probably coming. I mean, it's been very competitive in the south end for sure. There's hardly any inventory, condos, homes. Well, I would think like an investor, if they're coming in and paying cash, mm -hmm. you know, you know, that's not going to matter so much. But right. But well, that's automatically waived because right. they're not, they don't have a financing. Item right. Them. So but first time home buyers are going to have a problem because yes. they're buying down there because they lim have limited funds generally. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, it is a problem. And then they waive the, uh, you know, or inspections, you know, waiving mm -hmm. the inspection and then they get into trouble. It's just, I don't know. It's kind of a scary market it for really the, is. Yes. I mean, if, if you have lots of deep pockets, I guess it's not quite as scary, but for a lot of people, I think it's kind of a scarier scarier time it for sure is yeah. but then of course the rents are going so crazy that these people need to get out of their rentals and get mm -hmm. you know get into a house i mean putting all that money to nothing yes so. whole nother topic we need to find them houses don't we tammy exactly <laughs> something affordable out there speaking of i mean what do you think the best buys are in this local market i mean is there something specific to look for well or areas maybe? It's, yeah yeah i mean i'm still seeing Properties under 300 in the Auburn area really? and parts of Pierce County, the north part of Pierce County, um, even in Kent. But you might have to do some cosmetics and some little bit of elbow grease to fix it up. Um, I'm seeing that it's very competitive out there as far as condition of the home. If they are going to want top dollar and do all this bidding war, it can't be just so-so. It needs to be like over the top really nice at least in South King County mm -hmm. although I have seen bidding wars on things that were just average so that's another thing that's interesting is the buyers aren't as picky when the when the market is this way right although I tell my sellers you have to present really well in order to expect that kind of a response so mm -hmm. Um, but then they're like, well, I don't need to do it. I'm going to have 20 offers. You know, it's like, well, maybe you should and you might have 30 offers. But, yeah. you know, it's not quite that crazy. But you get my drift on yeah. on it's kind of you want them to do what they need to do in any kind of a market to have a great product to list and sell. Um, but then sometimes they think they cannot do some of the stuff because the market's so crazy. 
But it also depends on what comes on the market when they list, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're on the market and there's no, you know, no competition, then, uh, you know, maybe they don't have to do as much. But if some other home is listed and like value and they've painted and Mm -hmm. put some nice plants in the front yard, then your your house could sit a little longer. And then you're in a situation like, wow, this house hasn't sold in a week. What's wrong with it? Yes. And I do have buyers that go, why has this been on 10 days? It's like. Well, let's take a look. (laughs) Well, they had a review date seven days out. So, but um, yeah, and that's another thing we're seeing is list date, review date. Um, They're not always looking at uh, offers on receipt. They will want to hold it through a weekend so they can do some open houses because literally you get no market exposure. You list today, sell tomorrow. If they want to have any kind of significant market exposure, we try to give it through the weekend. So that's why you do see the review dates. And then that's what's creating the frenzy because you'll end up with multiple offers if you wait. But it's like, do you take the first offer? Well, in this one other situation, we did take a great offer that came in. It was in a condominium. We knew it wouldn't appraise if it went out of crazy bidding war. Right. Took it. Perfect offer. Sometimes you will take them sooner. Sometimes you'll hold and do the review. So just depends. mm -hmm. So as far as listing strategies, I guess that's that's one as far as like putting that date out there and giving some time. Is there anything yes. else that you that you recommend to your to your sellers? Well, just clearing everything out because that's still very important. They still have to be able to see what they're buying and mm-hmm. minimal repairs and just the you know the same things we've been doing year after year with getting a property sold. Staging is way more important. There's no more real vacant homes. I mean, you can do that, but it's better to have some kind of staging going on. People with the internet the way it is and everybody shops online, the pictures are so important. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yes. I mean, everything happens right. before they, anybody ever goes out to the neighborhood, right? So <laughs> it has to present well on the photos. So I always use professional photography for that reason. Well, thank you so much, Tammy. This has been really, really yes. helpful information. I'm Very sure our listeners are, um, are going to learn a lot from that. Thank so, you so much. You are welcome. Uh, When we come back, thank you for tuning in to Financial Fitness Northwest. And when we get back, we'll be talking with Dave Kwok um, with Hope Central Pediatrics. To find out more about our topics discussed on today's show, you can find us online at www.financialfitnessnw.com.